We are ready to begin. If uh, you all would please go ahead and rise. I'll ask God's blessing on the Bible study tonight here, and we will get started. Great God in heaven, Father, we bow and give you thanks for this evening and for bringing all of us here safely together. We pray that those who are with us uh, via the webcast will, are in good health as well. And we pray for them and their well-being. We thank you, Father, for our calling and the knowledge that you have opened to our minds and hearts to understand as we study tonight into a very personal and very important matter that relates to our spiritual welfare. Pray, Father, that your blessing would be upon us here and upon the hearing. Help us to understand deeply something that is very important in terms of developing a very close relationship with you. So we pray for your, your guidance. <clears throat> we pray for your blessing. We do so in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to open tonight with a um, personal story, and I guess uh, in keeping with my title, it's a bit of a confession, <clears throat> but I'm going to go back a few years and tell on myself uh, something that uh, happened to me that kind of shaped my life and formed my life at a very young age. I was... Uh, Taken with my mother, I was probably four or five years old, and we had stopped one day at the little local grocery store, the kind that you used to have years ago, run by, you know, usually a husband and wife and just a, a local neighborhood grocery store, where you could get everything from a box of cereal to a quart of milk to um, a pound of bologna, hand sliced right there on the spot and wrapped up in the white <clears throat> wrapping paper for you. As my mother was going through the aisles <clears throat> shopping, excuse me, <clears throat> I wondered, as I did, uh, as any four-year-old would do, into the candy aisle. And stores like that always had, you know, uh, half an aisle of candy and all kinds. It was all loose penny candy. And I didn't have any money on me, and I looked, and I lusted, and I looked, and I lusted, and I knew for some reason my mom wasn't going to buy me any candy that day. And so I, I reasoned in my mind, you know, they're not going to miss just a few pieces of penny candy. So I just kind of reached in, grabbed a few, and stuck them in my pocket, and whistled Dixie on the way home. I got home, and I decided to enjoy my candy. And I had a little... Secret, I thought it was a secret spot, a little stairway behind the bedroom leading up into the attic where I was going to sit there and enjoy it. And I was probably rustling the papers a little bit too loud. My mother heard me and she opened the door and wondered, what are you doing? Where did you get that candy? And so this was my George Washington moment right here. And I, I said, but, you know, I took it from the grocery store. And did she hit the ceiling? like a Saturn V rocket about to take off. She jerked me off the, that staircase, and whatever I had in my mouth was, you know, half chewed and whatever. She probably maybe spit it out. And whatever was left in my pocket, she drug me out to the car and back to that grocery store we went. And to the owner, she put me. And she said, you tell him what you did. And here I was, you know, what do I do? I, I, you know, I'm caught, busted. And I told him, and, you know, I was ashamed, I cried, and, and he, um, you know, he forgave me, whatever, and, and I went home, and I'm sure I got a spanking out of all of that. But I'll tell you from that, I learned a lesson. I didn't do any more shoplifting after that. Uh, I, I really learned a big lesson. I'm gr grateful for that. My mother taught me that uh, at a very early age. It kept me from, uh, you know, being an angel with dirty, a dirty face, for those of you that know that old movie. And um, it set me on the right course. What I had to do, obviously, was to confess that I had taken the candy and it was not mine. It had not been paid for. It was embarrassing. But in the process, I learned a big lesson and got cleared of it. You know, I was, I was embarrassed for the moment and uh, chagrined. And, you know, after a day or two, you pass over. But I never forgot the lesson. And I used that story of myself to get into what I want to talk about here tonight, which has been entitled, Confession is Good for the Soul. What I want to do with us tonight is take us through a, one of the most profound prayers in, in Scripture, back in Daniel chapter 9. 
So you can go ahead and start turning to Daniel chapter 9. We have in Daniel 9 one of uh, no less than a handful of prayers that are made in the Bible by some of the, the, the men of God where they actually prayed for the people of God. And this is a prayer that David made for the people, uh, for his people Israel. I remember the story, Daniel was a young Jewish a man taken captive with all the other Jews to Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar II had um, invaded the land um, in the first invasion of that period. And he took the cream of the crop among them being Daniel and his friends to Babylon and, and the story goes out there. And when we come to the story in Daniel chapter 9, <clears throat> um, Babylon has fallen to the Persians, Daniel has carried on in his role there in the court. He now serves the Persian kings. And Daniel is, all through the book of Daniel, as I like to to bring it out, he's he's asking a great question. Why did all this happen? And what about my people Israel? And uh, what's going on here? And Daniel was aware of certain statements and promises and actually a prophecy that God had made that uh, is known in the Bible as the, the 70 weeks prophecy or a prophecy that after 70 years, actually, the Jews would return to Jerusalem. And he knew about this. And he continued to wonder and think, why did God let this happen to my people? Why did God punish my people? It's not that he didn't know, but what, what, what did the future hold? And he mourned for the, the condition that he and the nation uh, was in for all these years as he survived in a way that he did in Babylon. And when the the, uh, chapter opens here in Daniel chapter 9, we find that it is uh, the first year of the King Darius and uh, of of the Medes who has been king over the uh, realm of the Chaldeans. And verse 2 tells us that in the first year of his reign, as Daniel writes it, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah was the prophet that prophesied prior to the fall of Judah in Jerusalem for a number of years, more than four decades. Uh, Jeremiah did his prophesying. And several, on, on several occasions in Jeremiah, actually two that we know of, in chapter 28, uh, beginning in verse 11 of Jeremiah, and also in Jeremiah chapter 29, there is this promise that God makes that beyond the time of the the punishment for their sins and the captivity that they would endure, they would return in 70 years. And so Daniel knew that prophecy. He was familiar with the prophecies of Jeremiah, and particularly this one. No doubt this particular prophecy of a return after 70 years grew larger in the minds of those who knew about it in the captivity in Jerusalem as they got closer. And at this point in the story, Daniel is now is an older man, and he's getting closer to the end of this 70-year period. And he knows that something has got to happen and will happen, and yet it hasn't necessarily, and he's wondering again about the, the fate of his people. And that's kind of the setting for this um, uh, effort that he begins to make as he begins to, uh, to pray. Because in verse 3, uh, he begins in his prayer. And it's a very, very important prayer. Now, you will remember from another episode in Daniel's life, uh, uh, again, during the Persian period, they had tried to trap Daniel by his, uh, and kind of undermine him and kind of get him out of the way, some of the underlings of the court. The only way they could get to him uh, was to make a false decree that you couldn't pray to anybody but the king. And Daniel went ahead and prayed, as it says, his custom was three times a day. He was a praying man. And so when we look at this prayer, it's kind of a focused period of prayer. It goes on for uh, uh, several days uh, that he he gets involved in it here. And what it tells us is a number of different things. It's it's well worth us going through these verses. So let's begin in verse 3, and let's look at what it says uh, right away here. He says at verse 3, I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. All right. Now, what are we told here? Number one, 
we're told that he, he set himself his face toward God, which is an expression of determination. Daniel has cleared the deck of all his other duties and, and responsibilities uh, at this point as he, as he makes this prayer. Uh, he probably he could very well at this point have gotten off to himself to a, to a private place and maybe a retreat type setting, and he blocked away the time, marked it off on his calendar, didn't let anything come in that was going to uh, distract him. That's what it means to set your face. There are times when we need to do that, when we need to just push away the distractions, and even if necessary, um, get a babysitter, maybe a husband and wife do something like this for a day uh, or a, a weekend. We have our retreats for the men. We have our ladies' retreats, and uh, we uh, do a whole week-long retreat, more or less, for our young people. It's called summer camp, which is a, a retreat-like setting. And you know, it's, it's nothing wrong, and with it, as we can do it within our means and schedule to set a period of time aside at times just for setting ourselves toward God to, to seek Him. And He did this by prayer and for, by supplications and by fasting. Now, he, his fast could have taken on a, a complete no water, no food um, fast for a period of time. It, it may have been a, maybe just a water only. It might have been, as an, on another occasion, the indication is, is that he just ate very minimally for a, a, a three-week period of time. But the fasting was there, and he, he put on sackcloth and ashes. Now, how does that relate to us today? Well, it's kind of difficult. Uh, we, we don't necessarily sit around in ashes today. Uh, ashes is a symbol of humility and uh, really just prostrating ourselves. I guess you could take a few ashes out of your cold grate, your, your fire grate, and toss them over your head or something like that. Don't put them on your forehead. That's... Uh, that's another practice there, but we wouldn't necessarily do that. But it's, it's a symbol of, of humility. Uh, sackcloth was very rough clothing, which basically tells us that he put aside not only his everyday type clothing and put on a sackcloth, which is very utilitarian, uh, wouldn't take a lot of care. He probably didn't have to spend a lot of time figuring out, now, which sackcloth do I put on today? Uh, he probably had one, one color, one style, one design, which, again, simplifies your life a lot. You don't have to, oh, can, does this match? Hmm, let me look in the mirror on this. You, you, you see the whole process that, that this is telling us that he, he really did clear the deck. And, again, uh, living a life that does keep a lot of the distractions from eating away at our, our time and attention is very, very good. Uh, on a regular basis so that we can be focused on our job and our, our lives and, and even in a, to a spiritual life. But he set himself uh, to seek God and to talk with God and to seek God's understanding and the, and the mind of God on this particular issue for a period of time. Now, in verse 4, it tells us this, I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession. And I said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments. Note that word confession right there. This is a verbal expression of His state of mind and, as we're going to see, of sin. It is what I had to do when my mother caught me with the pilfered candy. I had to confess. And it hurt. But it was good for me and my life from that point on. I learned a big, big lesson about stealing, as perhaps you did in your own way with your life. Maybe something like that took place with you and you, had, uh, you got caught up short. But I had to confess, I could have lied, and that would have compounded the problem, and she knew that it would have been a lie. I could have just dug in my heels and said, I'm not going to go and face the grocer. But I had to face this adult who, again, as I was raised, I was raised to respect my adult, you know, any adult in my life. Uh, if I disrespected a teacher, she'll disrespect for a family member, an aunt or an uncle or a neighbor. Um, you know, if they didn't do it right there, and some of them did, the teachers I had, they would, they would uh, 
take care of it right there on the spot. And if mom and dad found out about it at home, I got it twice uh, for, for it, no questions asked. And the, the confession here, the verbal admission, and even to the point of, of the verbal expression of sin is what really is at the heart of what we're talking about in this prayer and what I want to get across to us here tonight, that this is a very important, critical component of cleansing ourselves of sin, the verbal expression. We'll come back to that, but I want that up front to be understood. That's, that's the, the, main, uh, the main point, perhaps, that we're, we're dealing with here tonight in this, in this uh, study. So he, he verbalizes this to God, O oh Lord, you're great, you're awesome, you keep your covenant mercy to those who keep his, the, your, your commandments. Now look what he said in verse 5. Verse 5 really gets into, drills deep into the confession. We have sinned and committed iniquity. All right? <clears throat> you know, that's a big, big admission. It was big admission for me to say to my mom, yeah, I stole it. I, you know, I took it from the grocery store. How about you? How hard has it been for you at any point to admit a sin? Now, a sin is a sin is a sin. We're not necessarily categorizing any sin tonight. Uh, uh, all sin brings the same penalty spiritually before God. All sin must have the same sacrifice applied to it, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. So in one sense, sin is sin. But as Daniel lays this out here, he says, we've sinned and, and committed iniquity. Now, a sin of stealing a bit of candy is one, is, you know, one sin the sin of a, another type of lie that might actually hurt other people, uh, some maybe irreparably in their life or their reputation, uh, perhaps the magnitude of the consequence is, is bigger there. But sin and iniquity here can take many different forms, and it can be a sin that is momentary, uh, weakness of the flesh. I had a weakness of the flesh momentarily. It was not an ingrained habit that I was used to or that I continued on, obviously, with the rest of my life. Sometimes, even as adults, we will sin out of a momentary weakness. But that doesn't mean that it is a hardened aspect of character in terms of, um, let's say, a willful resentment or a willful type of sin that the Bible will talk about, Okay. If I can distinguish that, again, keeping in mind sin is sin, is sin, but what Daniel is describing here is sin then that, in a sense, moves deeper because he says in the second phrase here of the verse, we have done wickedly and rebelled. As he describes Israel, we've done wickedly and we've rebelled, he says. Now, rebellion, God says in another occasion uh, when Saul had rebelled against Israel, the, the instruction sent through Samuel and the sacrifice of the people. And it's in uh, 1 Samuel 16. God says, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, witchcraft's pretty deep and is pretty much of an ingrained habit for those who give themselves over to that type of a dark spirit. He said, we've, also, we've not only sinned, but we've done wickedly and we've rebelled. That implies a series, if you will, serial sins over a period of time that sets one or a group of people in a course of <clears throat> um, wicked rebellion, in this case against the God. But he goes even deeper. And, he says, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Israel and Judah sinned. Okay, everybody you know, was human. That was just the course of human nature. But they also rebelled against God. But then they departed wholesale away from God's teachings and His judgments, His laws and His commandments to the point where they would not repent even when they prophet after prophet after prophet went to them, urging them carrying a message from God to turn back to God, to the covenant, 
They wouldn't do it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos. Look at the various prophets that are in the story of Israel and Judah. There are messages that have been left for us. And they went and they went and they went. There's one occasion during the, uh, the uh, kingship of Hezekiah, good King Hezekiah. Uh, remember, he instituted reforms, cleaned out the temple, reinstituted the, the holy days. And in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 10, Hezekiah has prepared this, uh, going to have, they're going to keep the Passover in the days of unleavened bread in Jerusalem, first time in, in years. And he sends his messengers out into the, to the other cities uh, to the north, as far as Ephraim and Manasseh, and even as far as it says as Zebulun to the north, inviting them to come to Jerusalem and keep the holy days. And they, it says they laughed the messengers to scorn and they would not come. They mocked them. They wouldn't go down. Now that is a removal. That's, that's more than a, in a sense, that's, that's a sin that has moved to not only rebellion, but where it says they, they utterly departed from God's precepts and judgments. Didn't even want to consider it when confronted frontally. Sometimes even in our own day as people have turned from the faith, I've seen situations where a person turned from the faith of God and then to the point it went from sin to rebellion to a mocking. The idea of keeping the Sabbath, keeping the holy days or, or the faith that they once knew. That's pretty deep. This is what Daniel says happened to his people. He confesses this. He lays it right out. He said, We've not heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Then he goes on in verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. And so he, he, his prayer becomes one of a, a confession for the entire people, for all, for all of the people. O Lord, to us, in verse 8, belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. The language here is very much like that of King David in Psalm 51, where he said, where David prayed, God against you and you only have I sinned. And this, this is the, the depth of the, the confession. He goes on in verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. He always puts God and His mercy and His forgiveness front and center even as he confesses the sins of the people. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against Him. Now, the oath that he refers to that is written in the Law of Moses here in verse 11, again, he would have known quite well. Uh, it would be the, the, uh, the oath that is written out in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, what we call the blessings and cursings chapters, where God said to Israel, uh, if you obey me and the covenant we have made, I will do this, I will do this, and I will bless you. You'll have abundant harvests. You will have uh, good health. You will, uh, you will lend, and you will not be in debt. And in Deuteronomy 28, verse 7, he makes a comment. He says that your, your enemies will flee before you. And because they obey. Then he goes on, it says, but if you disobey, then he lists the curses as well. Then at the end of both of those two chapters, he also says, but if you repent, then I will restore you. That's always a part of God's promise. But those are two very deep chapters that, that 
Daniel calls to mind here that uh, is, are described here in the law of Moses, and he knows that what has happened to his people has been because of that, uh, and that, uh, that great disaster has, has taken place. You know, when we look at those two chapters, and as we have in the church for many years, we've, we've understood those to apply to God's people today, to modern Israel. Uh, to the people, uh, the English-speaking nations who have been the recipients of the promises to Abraham uh, in a physical sense in this uh, time of the end, in the, uh, this period of, of history where the English-speaking peoples of American, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and others that have um, <clears throat> been impacted by their, uh, by their relationship with them through the last two to 250 years have all benefited in many different ways from that. And we understand that the, uh, the responsibility of what God says there is upon our nations today. And really, uh, in, in, the long, in the larger term, it's, it's upon all nations, but specifically to the, the English-speaking nations. And I, I've been thinking about that. And, uh, I think uh, all of us have been trying to figure out the impact and the meaning of the most recent terrorist attacks in Paris last Friday night and the shock of the uh, uh, attacks there in the, the City of Light, 129 people killed and over 300 wounded. Of course, a few weeks before that, over 200, uh, nearly 300 people were shot, were apparently now bombed out of the sky uh, in a Russian jetliner. But because of our, let's say, our relationships, and I'm not saying this is right, but we, we've been moved more by what happened in France than what happened to the Russian airliner, even though both now seem to be terrorist attacks and resulting in great loss of life. I, uh, I was talking to the kids today that uh, probably some of you have done it on your Facebook site. You've turned your, your profile picture into a blue, red, and white striped image, as people have done in solidarity. We didn't do that with the Russian jetliner. Did you notice that? I didn't, and I haven't done it for this one either, for, you know, but that's another story. Um, but they're, they're both terrorist attacks. Now, what's happened in, with, with France uh, highlights the larger problem of terrorism and the world condition and the world stage right now. Uh, just looking at it from a strictly political nation versus nation situation and uh, with ISIS and, and these terrorist groups, what is taking place is they do not fear us. They don't fear France, they don't fear Russia, and they certainly do not fear the United States to bring it down to us. And what is said in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 about our enemies fleeing from us, we're at a point now where they don't flee, they don't fear us. They don't fear to shake their fist at us and to say, we're coming to your, we're coming to you, America, next. There is no fear anymore. Now, we can look at all of the reasons politically. We could look at the president. We could look at the policies that are in place. We could look at the withdrawal of troops, and all of that is a part of the actual scene. But, you know, something for you and I, as we read the Bible and as we understand God's promises, the real reason that, that all this is hap taking place for you and I, it should go far beyond a geopolitical analysis or something that you might hear on Fox News by Mr. Krauthammer or Mr. Will or any other news source, World Net Daily, Glenn Beck, or whoever you might listen to as your guru. You have gurus, I have gurus. The real reason is spiritual, and it's because of sin, and it's because of what Daniel says here. We have rebelled, sinned, committed iniquity, rebelled, and we have removed ourselves from your judgments and your precepts. And this, Daniel says, is why your wrath has come upon us. The Babylonians didn't fear Judah any longer. They knew that they were a weak, morally, spiritually people. Frankly, our enemies know that we are a weak, moral people. From their point of view, weak spiritually as well. But from God's point of view, we are very weak spiritually. And what is happening uh, to us 
is because of spiritual sin. As Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26 brings out. Keep that in mind, regardless of what any pundit says on television or on, uh, on the internet. Uh, there, and yeah, there are you know, things that could be done and other reasons, but uh, God said, I will, I will remove certain things, and, and there, there's been a lot removed. Daniel understood that. And as you sigh and cry for the sins of Joseph, as, as we pray thy kingdom come, um, don't pray for a resurgence of a surge <laughs> militarily or, you know, the right leader or whatever necessarily. Pray for a repentance. It is indeed a time, a unique time for America and for the world and what God is doing in this world right now. There's a great deal of turmoil in the nations. But Daniel gets really, drills very, very deep to the bedrock of the problem. It is because of sin that our, that our nation is not respected uh, to the point of a fear to intervene because God uh, in some ways has removed a part of the blessing and a part of the protection there. Not completely, not completely, but there should be enough there to warn us of all people. And this is where, where Daniel is. He's, he's learned about this. But he keeps God in the, in the forefront. Verse 12, he goes on, he says, He has confirmed His words which He spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. And what he's referring to is that Jerusalem and Israel were a people in covenant with, the, with God. And as God said Himself, look, what you're doing in some of this dialogue with Israel through the prophets, what you're doing is unheard of among the nations, that you would leave me the true God and what has been put upon you in the blessings. And that's why Daniel says here that what, what's been done has never been done before under heaven. It was unique. Other nations came and went. The, the, the fall of Israel and, and ultimately Judah and Jerusalem was unique because of the relationship they had with God. And he understood that. As it is written in the law of Moses in verse 13, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet, he said, we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. He knew that the people had not done that. Who was doing it in this prayer? Daniel was. He was praying for his people. Daniel understood this about prayer and even about God's Word and about God's promises. Daniel understood that God's Word was sure, His purpose would stand. He had already revealed to Nebuchadnezzar um, and to Belshazzar that God was supreme. God's will uh, trumped that of the kings. By example, by teaching indeed through the early chapters of Daniel, he had done that several times. Daniel understood God was sovereign and that He was in charge, but he also knew what the individual responsibility was, and he knew the power of prayer. And he knew that if there was going to be, then when this return, according to the prophecy, would happen, and a rebuilding of Jerusalem and a return of the people to the land, if it was going to endure and if there was going to be a lesson learned, there had to be, at the heart of that revival, a prayer and confession of sin, that the people had to come to that. If God was going to revive the people in that age and at that time, the lesson for us today is this, that if, if God is going to revive us, and I pray that He does, that's part of my prayer these days, is that God would give us, His people today, a revival of zeal, of passion, of energy, of faith, of cooperation, of enduring faith for the Word, for each other, and for the, the work of the gospel, we need a revival. If we're going to ever have that, we've got to have that. It's got to be accompanied by prayer. And as Daniel tells us, for all of us, even as a church collectively, there should be that element of confession to acknowledge sin wherever it might be, and a secret repentance, and then a, a zeal through the mercy of God to be instruments in His hand. This is, again, at the heart of what 
moved Daniel to enter into this period in time of prayer. He goes on in verse 14. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which He does, though we've not obeyed His voice. Again, he didn't blame God. He didn't get bitter toward God. He didn't say, oh, God, it's not worth it. You know, and, and he didn't worship a Babylonian God. He kept faith with his God, the true God. And he didn't blame God. He, he knew that even as God punished the people, it was according to a, a just and, and merciful way that, that God works and deals. And that would take a whole other treatment, but that's important to understand. God is righteous in all the works which He does, even though we might sin. He's he's faithful in goodness, and He's also faithful in, in His punishment. Verse 15, And now, O Lord our God, who brought Your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made Yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all Your righteousness, I pray, Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. And so he now begins to move into uh, the heart of his petition. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. The sanctuary or the temple in Jerusalem had been desecrated and torn down. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations, and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. We are called by God's name today. It is the church of God. We bear that name. And this prayer can give us an impetus to pray that God would listen, He would act, He would forgive us where we might need to be forgiven and help us to be revived and understand the times in which we live in this world. We can't be divorced from that. No matter how much we might want to or just plain ignore, um, we, we live in some very momentous times in world history. And we of all people should be seeking and striving to understand what it all means. As we understand prophecy, God's overall plan, and especially the the prophecies that we see yet ahead of us, to where we seek to understand what does this mean? So we're not moved by fear, a fear that in a sense, you know, gets us off of God's righteousness and, and out of control, but a, a proper, uh, we, we don't want to be moved in, in that way. We want to have a confidence that, that God is in charge and that He is moving among the nations today. And these things happen uh, as they do, but God's purpose and God's plan is moving along. It's only then that we can make sense of it, understand it, and have confidence and do our job. And I do believe we have a job to do. And it is incumbent upon us to understand that. And and in that way, we then do justice to to bearing the name the church of God, the people of God. And this is what Daniel was was coming down to, is he wanted to understand really a specific prophecy, what is called the 70 weeks prophecy. His prayer ends here at verse 19. And you will see that it picks that then the remainder of chapter 9 does go into a detailed explanation of that prophecy. But it's the prayer that we're looking at here tonight, and it's the prayer that should give us some very personal instruction about our own lives when we may fall short as individuals and our collective life as a church, as a people as well, because 
this prayer of Daniel is both personal and it's collective. It's personal in that Daniel accepts responsibility. He said himself, and he makes confession. But he also understands what has happened with his people and his nation, and he is laying that all before uh, God as well. Now, l- let me bring this down a little deeper into our own personal application so that we don't neglect a lesson uh, from this uh, for ourselves. And that is <clears throat> our own need to confess our sins, as we may sin, as we might be caught. In whatever way we might be caught and have a sin brought to our attention. When I was four years old, it was my mom caught me with some candy that wasn't mine. As we are adults, there are other times when we will sin in word, against each other perhaps, by things we might say either directly to someone or about someone, apart from them, or other deeds that indeed are sins. And we know they are. And we may struggle with. And they may last for quite some time in our life, and they may even get to the point where they get a hold on our lives. And we struggle with them. How do we deal with that? Well, overcoming is... um, Big word in the Bible. If you look at the, we went through the seven churches recently, all the messages of the seven churches. To every one of those churches, they are encouraged to overcome. He who overcomes. Overcome. Uh, Overcoming's, um, sometimes I thought, you know what? We we, we need just a good, we need a, we just need to focus on overcoming sometimes. We struggle. We might identify our, you know, some of our, and we know we've got certain issues, but when was the last time we could point to a, having cleared ourselves of something and, and can say, I've overcome that. It no longer trips me up. It no longer has a hold on my life. I have moved away from that. I have overcome that. With what we look, read here tonight, and one other verse that I'd like for you to turn to is over in 1 John chapter 1. The first step, could I put it to us, the first step in overcoming, I will say, is to confess. To confess, to verbalize the sin. If we do that, I say that that can be the first step in the road to overcoming. But we have to confess. Look at what John writes here in 1 John chapter 5. And let's look at verse 8. He says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, we're, we're lying to ourselves which in itself is a sin, it's just to ourself, isn't it? And it's not true. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess. Daniel made a confession for the people. John says that if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and He will cleanse us. That is a a promise. But we have to confess. Now, to confess means to verbalize it, literally, to say to our Father, and this is not a confession that we make um, here. He's not talking about, you know, confessing to another man. There, There may be a need to seek help with a minister, with a competent, qualified professional who uh, maybe with the problem that we are struggling with, and that's where you know another individual might be involved with us. But ultimately, and I think at the heart of the, the primary meeting here, the confession has to be to God. In prayer, Father, I have sinned. I have this problem. I am a blank. What is it, the first step in uh, the... 12-step program of 
Alcoholics Anonymous that they have to do. Hi, I am, name, I am an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. To get to that point may be a long road for an alcoholic or an, another, another addict to admit, but it is a confession. And there is a therapy in doing that. There is a, there, it's therapeutic. It's helpful. And when we do that with God, and this is where I'm, I'm saying it, now if we need to go to a, again, to a minister and get help, spiritual counseling or uh, other uh, counseling, that, that's therapeutic too. And that may be a necessary step in the process. But ultimately, and the first and the primary step is with God. That's what I'm addressing here tonight. Father, I have sinned. Father, I am your servant. I am an, I have done blank. And to say it, not to say, well, Father, forgive, forgive me of my sins. I've sinned today. Forgive me of all my sins. And we kind of give a, you know, ask for a blanket pardon from God in a very quick mumbled prayer. And we know way back in our minds that, you know, we, we've got, you know, what, what, what it is that we need to overcome. Say it. Say it to God. This, I think, is, it, is the intent of the meaning here. And he says that we will be forgiven and cleansed. Now, we will have to overcome and we will have to take other steps and measures in our life to deal with it, to remove ourselves from sin and an environment sometimes and other practices that will lead us to sin. But we can expect God's forgiveness and we can expect His help in overcoming. But the first step is to confess it. It is to confess it. And if we say, he, again in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word's not in us. So we have to take that step, I, I'm, I'm saying here. My little children, verse 1 of chapter 2, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. <clears throat> now, really, these verses here in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, go deeper into what is necessary steps, again, additional necessary steps in overcoming that I don't have time to go into here tonight, uh, but th th this goes deeper along the, the process. But we're, we're just talking about the first step. I watched recently um, <clears throat> one of these TED Talks, um, and some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, you need to listen to more of them because they're only 20 minutes. And I've gone more than 20 minutes tonight. But it was a journalist, a French journalist in this case, who was recounting being in Baghdad back in 03 when um, the Second Gulf War ignited and being in a hotel room where a bomb, one of these bombs hit it and created a large explosion, death, destruction. He, was, he survived it being a floor or two above it. And he had to go down and help get people out of it. And he's a journalist, he's not, a, he's not an army personnel, but he was describing the reaction upon him as he had to deal with the after effects. He himself went through what they call PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, as many service men and women do uh, in the war zone and come back and have to deal with the aftermath of it because of the trauma. You can have that prolonged stress, post-event post stress, in many, from many different situations. It's very common, obviously, with our military personnel. The gentleman giving this talk was basically had one point. He said that the, the therapy that he had to go through to get himself moved beyond it, to where he could cope, involved talking about it. Talking about it. And again, it's, this, is well, this is a well-known part of the therapy of dealing with PTSD, is they have to get the service person uh, or the individual into a into even talking about it as a vital step in beginning to cope with it and move beyond it. Talk therapy. Talk about it to a competent individual that can help them work through the stress that is racking their life or at that point with a lot of anger, fear, and other, other um, results of, of that. It's the same thing. You, to verbalize it and to talk to another person about it. It can, that, it can be hard for some people to do. But it's the same principle here in terms of, you know, sin can be kind of like PTSD. It stresses our bodies, 
phys physically and certainly spiritually and creates trauma and distortion and a whole host of other problems that we perhaps don't always recognize are the result of sin, to confess it to God, to talk to God about it, that's a step, a first step in, in beginning to deal with uh, spiritual sin. This is what I think we are, we are being told here, and this is why confession is, <clears throat> confession is good for the soul and why it is so important. What, what have we learned here tonight? And looking at Daniel, we saw a, a man who understood the, the overall arching purpose and plan of God unfolding in his life. He was living through it, and he knew that that was going to stand, that God's purpose would endure, and yet he struggled for his people, and he also struggled to understand exactly where he and his people fit in that timeline of God's purpose and plan, and why that particular left turn that they'd taken into captivity had taken place. But he knew it was all up to God, but that did not deter him from praying as if it was all up to him. And therein lies a very important principle for, for us, too, actually. God's purpose is going to stand. His plan is being brought to pass. It doesn't deter us from praying in faith, regularly praying and praying with a fervency and with an urgency for our own lives, uh, for our, uh, our times, to understand our, our, ourselves, and to be praying as Daniel did, setting aside a period of time and focused on prayer and on study, laboring the Word, and seeking God's understanding, and even to the point then of making confession. Let me leave you with this thought. As we take this lesson of, of a righteous man, who, one who as we didn't read on here, but well, let me just go back to Daniel 9. Let's read what... It says here about it, and there's so many great statements about Daniel and uh, how he, his character was and, and the type of, he, he was a wise man in, in whom the Spirit of God was, it says, and that was recognized by the Gentiles. But here in Daniel 9, as the angel finally came and gave him the answer that he was looking for, um, he said, verse 21, I was speaking, and, and the man Gabriel who I saw in the vision at the beginning, was caused to fly swiftly and reached me. And the, Gabriel says, O Daniel, verse 22, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command, command went out. You know, when Daniel's lips started to move, the command went out, probably because the lips were in sync with his heart already at that point. And the, the words were sincere, in other words. There was a sincerity and the command went out. And I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. You are greatly beloved. For many reasons, God loved Daniel. I think one of them was that he had this love and his, this concern for his people, among other things. But let's just focus on that one. And let me leave you with this thought, two thoughts. Pray for each other. Take a lesson from, from this and, and pray for each other that we might all draw closer to God. And brethren, pray for the church. Pray for the church as a whole, the collective, a collective supplication to God for the, for the church. That God would forgive us where we need to be forgiven, that God would empower us and strengthen us where we uh, lack that of ourselves, that God would uh, give us boldness, give us confidence, build trust among ourselves, build and you know, knitly, fitly frame and, and knit the joints of the body together in, in our part of the body where we are. Pray for the church as you pray for each other, where you need to pray for each other, and, and, and you're, we, we know of the needs of other, other individuals, but then pray for the collective church as a whole. The church is always in need of prayers. But... Never, never more so than it, that perhaps at this time that, that we can 
be bound together to accomplish something in God's hand at a critical moment in, the, in our nation and in the world, pray for the church. Pray God's blessing and guidance upon us to, to guide us to a unity, to guide us to a trust, to guide us to a collective urgency and zeal for the mission that we have been given and to not only accomplish the mission but the vision of the church so that we can then be effective instruments in God's hands. Start with confession, both personally and collectively, because it's good for the soul. It's good for you and your life and mine, and it's good for the collective body, the spiritual body of the church of God. That'll conclude everything tonight. The next Bible study will be in two weeks, and uh, Gary Petty will be here conducting that Bible study, the third in this series. And then after that, I think we will have a break until uh, January, 1st of January, and we will begin in January with a series on the Ten Commandments. So that gives you a little bit of uh, insight as we go forward here. So good night, everyone, and be safe going home.